Hello to everybody. And firstly, I'm very sorry that I can't physically meet you right now due to unexpected changes in my calendar that I did not have any power by myself to, to change. Secondly, thank you very much for inviting, uh, inviting me to, to address your Congress, because I think that the subject of rare diseases is very important for Europeans, for people uh, having the conditions and for our economies. Because, you know, uh, rare diseases actually aren't that rare. There's about uh, five to 8,000 different kind of a rare diseases, maybe more. And that means that is from 27 up to 36 million Europeans having rare diseases. And the figure could, could be even uh, higher because these conditions are today still are under treated and under diagnosed. That means that actually from 8 to up even to 12% of the Europeans would have a rare disease. So actually that means that uh, altogether they are very common, they are expensive, they are underdiagnosed, they are undertreated, and they are causing a lot of economic uh, suffering and of course suffering for the people because it is estimated that it is up to three years before the diagnosis is normally got, uh, uh, getting, uh, get to, to be the right one. And then when the condition actually is rightly treated, the condition quite often has deteriorated already and the costs are up to uh, half a million that uh, have uh, uh, the costs have are uh, up to half million that uh, that are paid by by that time uh, before uh, the whole treatment uh, properly has started so what that actually means is that we would need to have a total new kind uh, european system to treat uh, diagnose and to compensate the uh, often medicines for rare diseases. It's quite understandable that the uh, general practitioner quite often is not capable of uh, recognizing one of the rare diseases, probably because he or she would meet it, uh, meet it once, uh, maximum once uh, by their lifetime. And this is part of the problem why the diagnosis gets to, to be right by so late stage. So firstly, we would need to develop that kind of a diagnosing system where we use the digital uh, in the systems, e-health, where we use the big data, that if a person goes to a general practitioner and be it three times or four or six times without a uh, proper diagnosis, proper treatment, and what is the most important improvement in the condition, so that re it really shows that uh, what is done is actually affecting uh, affecting positively the condition of the person. It would al uh, alarm the system on next level, and that kind of a system then would send automatically the information of that patient and the tests um, that have been run so far to the next level. And this is the reference centers of the rare diseases. And by that way, actually, we could sort of catch up earlier the different kind of conditions of rare diseases and actually get the treatment diagnosed and treatment to be right uh, on the place. These kind of developments have been proposed and they are on the way of uh, being uh, developed, but they are not to this kind of a best practices, so they are not yet that kind of a standard in the Europe, or that is not even uh, on places that kind of a uh, compulsory procedure on treating uh, rare diseases, and in the next phase on the E level, on the program of uh, treating rare diseases, I think that this kind of a uh, catch up early on uh, the uh, people when they are uh, visiting the general practitioners should be uh, as a, the common standard all over the Europe. Okay, uh, then uh, what is the uh, next stage is that 80% uh, of uh, rare diseases are genetically inherited. 
and we would need to develop on European wide a best practice and standard of genetic testing. Uh, of course, adults in uh, at some uh, point, but uh, of the newborn uh, babies, so that we can catch up the conditions that are or could lead to rare diseases very early on. And that means that that kind of a people would be then on our radar where we would uh, then uh, have the possibility to, to start the treatment and at least uh, have the regular uh, checks on places. What is the big thing is that if we create this kind of a genetical testing, this uh, testing needs to be the information of the patient and the medical practitioner only. Because think uh, what would be the cause if this kind of a the information would be shared with the insurance companies, uh, for example. We all know how expensive, extremely expensive, this kind of a healthcare insurances are if you take them on the late stages of your life, because of course then the life expectancy is shorter and the probability of diseases is higher. And then again, if you could sort of a risk calculate already by the genetic information, of the upcoming costs, that would actually mean that uh, in uh, certain cases these people would be less treated or the treatment would be on uh, uh, much higher costs uh, when insurances are in place. So the data protection and the protection of uh, the patients is something we have to bear in mind when we start this kind of a, uh, <clears throat> practices of genetical testing uh, of mothers uh, when they are pregnant and testing of newborn babies. Okay, uh, then we actually would uh, need to have a better European reference on diagnostics all over of the rare disease field. What are the proper diagnostics? Plus then, while, as you know, the digital uh, side is developing with a very fast pace, what we would need is this kind of a Dr. Watson system that would have been, uh, would have need to be launched all over the Europe, where actually you would pick up the suggestions and guidelines automatically for the doctor, what kind of a genetical tests or what kind of a laboratory of uh, uh, other kind of a tests uh, are part of the proper diagnosis. And then again, on what phase you should actually get in contact with the European reference centers or uh, have some other this kind of a consultancy um, when uh, diagnosing uh, the patient. So everything starts with early, early on diagnosing, preventing and taking care as soon uh, as possible. Then uh, um, the question of, uh, of course, quite often is that uh, how you create that kind of a system and what this is going to cost. And I sympathize the public uh, healthcare problems with the money, but the, then again, we need to see that the, actually we cannot impact ourselves and our genes. And this is a question of constitutional rights, equality, human rights and patient rights. We all have the right for proper early on diagnosis, treatment, rehabilitation and good care. And this shouldn't be sort of altered between the member states, between the cities or between the uh, diseases that is actually the situation right now in uh, many of the uh, member states. Then um, what uh, actually is pretty much uh, on, uh, on ongoing process is firstly the reference centers that are very rapidly being uh, set on place in different member states, in different disease categories, and their cooperation uh, is uh, intensified. Then uh, actually the national programs of the rare diseases uh, have been uh, put on place in almost uh, all of the member states. Finland has the national program uh, for years 2014 to 2017. 
and our reference center network is pretty much going on place and it is on the right places so that is in the university hospitals where actually you should uh, co concentrate the demanding treatment uh, of the rare diseases. Then when it is diagnosed, when the treatment is on place, in many of the cases there are not reasons why you couldn't sort of refer back to general practitioner on every day sort of uh, following up of the condition or renewing the medications or other that kind of uh, issues. But then again, quite often there are that kind of other diseases where you might have this kind of interaction or complications and it should be a automation uh, that the people with rare diseases with complicated uh, uh, complicated uh, interactions should be referred to uh, university hospitals or or other that kind of a proper uh, treatment facilities because um, a different kind of uh, 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 hazardous situations might occur uh, in uh, in this phase. Okay. What is then then the next stage? Next stage is EU should have a common research budget that is a bigger for rare diseases. Uh, for example, in Finland, we do not have at the moment a separate budget line for research of the rare diseases. So it is coming up from uh, the different budget lines. And actually part of this rare diseases research should be not only the basic genetic and medical research, but the research of e-health. So how this kind of uh, uh, e-consultation reference centers, big data uh, could be used better and that uh, again the remote controls and remote follow-up uh, by e-health uh, possibilities at the home of uh, the patients themselves. And actually when the developments are uh, going on on so fast pace, the possibilities in this area uh, are enormous uh, uh, in, in near already now and in the near future. Uh, then uh, the big issue, uh, of course, is the orphan net. It is the orphan medicine, the medi medication of the rare diseases. They are not always very expensive, but in many cases the cost is the big question. And then if you look at it from the perspective of the local hospital, for example, it is like a negative lottery. The treatment of one person in rare disease could mount up to one million per year, or even in some cases higher figures. And of course then you put uh, the different kind of uh, diseases and patients in comparison. How many newborn, how many elderly peoples, how many pneumonias, how many this or that diabetes you could treat with this amount of the money. And this is actually a wrong uh, competition where the patients are uh, put on the same line and that should never happen, never, never happen. And this is still the case, everyday case, in all over the Europe with different kind of a rare diseases and different kind of a patients. Plus then the code of conduct is very varying what kind of a diseases are compensated and uh, paid for in uh, different uh, parts of the Europe and that, that can be very heartbreaking for a per person or let's say for uh, parents of a child to know that uh, in the neighboring countries these and uh, these treatments are paid but uh, uh, in, in my country or my city for example it is not done. And so what I have proposed is that in the longer run we should actually have a common uh, uh, European uh, orphan medicine, not only the network where you have registered uh, the uh, uh, orphan medicines, but uh, the whole fund that would actually not only accept and register the, the, the medicines, but it, uh, the, uh, the, the price negotiations between the uh, companies <clears throat> should be led on European level because uh, if it's one in the lifetime or very rarely where the local hospital is negotiating of the price of the medication with the medical company, it is quite understandable that there are not that much of a discount, so uh, leave, uh, leave it to the negotiate of the price. 
But then again, if it would be a agreement on European level, the prices would be better. And then again, it would actually be better for the, medi uh, the pharmaceutical companies also, because more of the medicine would be bought when it would happen on the European level. Okay, how then that would uh, actually function? It would function uh, in the way that every member state would pay their part on yearly regular basis on European budget or a different fund for this purpose. And all in all, as a sum, it is not very much. According to study, uh, studies, it's only, only a 5% of uh, pharmaceutical and treatment costs that are co caused by uh, rare diseases. Because in that sense they are rare, it doesn't overall uh, take that uh, big part of uh, the whole medical uh, costs uh, of the budgets or pharmaceutical uh, uh, part of the budgets. But then again it is this negative lottery that when it happens to the local hospital, or an uh, individual person, the costs are quite often uh, felt to be unbearable. And then again, if it would function in this kind of a insurance logic that everybody pays for the fund and the fund is negotiating and getting the, uh, the prices right and then delivering the medicine for the people in need would ensure better prices more stability on the pricing for member states and hospitals and medi medical practitioners and it would ensure better access to medicine and at the same footing uh, in different uh, European member states and sort of uh, take better right for the patient rights and human rights in uh, this sense. And. Uh, well, I, I, I would hope that this is something that uh, is something you could consider and consider even supporting as an initiative if you feel it could be uh, right. Then uh, about the reference centers, um, I think that uh, this is something uh, that should be on our radar on developing. How? For, for first of all, you uh, take this uh, e-health as mentioned and digital pot uh, potential and how you get the best practices and guidance of the treatment so that it would be uh, delivered in uh, all member states and all private and public uh, medical uh, practitioners so that we ensure really the best uh, practice. Then again, um, what, uh, what is uh, important is that we take on board the patients as being part of the process. Because quite often what happens is that this discussion goes over the, happens over the heads of the patients and this is not right. And overall we are discussing very much of the patient-centered uh, um, systems. And quite often in, in rare diseases, the case is that you need a expertise of different fields of uh, uh, medical expertise. And what would need to happen is that in a uh, patient-centered model, the patient really is physically centered. And you get with uh, all the specialists around the patient at the same time once, uh, once it is needed. It can be directly in the treatment centers and it can be via Skype or via other means. But the consultation as, uh, should happen with the patient, hearing and consulting the patient and consulting with different specialists to ensure that you get this kind of a co-creation of different kind of a knowledge instead of a bits and pieces of different fields of uh, knowledge where you really don't always get the bigger pictures uh, right. This is extremely uh, difficult because our systems of uh, treating diseases is very silo-based and it is very hierarchical and uh, to really uh, get that uh, model on uh, uh, on place we would need a lot of support, a lot of pressure from uh, uh, patient organizations firstly, a lot of knowledge and willingness uh, from the uh, medical uh, expertise, especially doctors, 
and this kind of a uh, European model by the reference centers how to do it and of course hopefully a bit of the European funding to when the model is uh, uh, developed. And then we actually would also need a support for the patient organizations uh, so that they can uh, deliver the information and support for the patients. They can be part of the consultation process, how these uh, treatment processes in patient centered treatment processes should be uh, uh, developed and uh, how you should ensure this patient safety when it comes to data protection and uh, how this kind of a EU gene pool registers of uh, uh, rare diseases should actually treat it so that it benefits both the research, the treatment of all the patients, but the privacy of the patient um, uh, themselves. Lastly, but not leastly, two other points. The first point is actually that, uh, according to my understanding, quite often when you talk about uh, young people and children, the uh, teen years, the age of 16, is pretty difficult time of changing from pediatric to adult uh, medical care practices. And the proposal have been, and I'm very supportive to it, that actually you should transfer it, at least in these cases when they are complicated, the age limit to be 18, when actually you could handle both uh, the physical development years and, and mental uh, development years uh, better. And last point, and this is a long story I won't uh, dwell in detail, but we would need to develop a support system of uh, informal carers. Uh, that, of course, would need to be uh, developed and supported much better in uh, overall with el for elderly and disabled people and people with different medical conditions. But uh, special attention should be paid uh, for rare diseases because then uh, quite uh, often the needs for the care and the needs of the informal care are very specific and so we would need to have a European program and understanding how these families and informal carers are supported so that the uh, patient uh, also could, uh, could be treated and, and feel as well as possible. Once again, sorry that I couldn't be there with you. Thank you for your work. Please do send me on my email, uh, any proposals, questions you have concerning rare disease, diseases or uh, medical or health issues uh, in general on the EU, because all of my knowledge, of course, uh, is uh, depth on the contacts and knowledge what I uh, get from the patients and specialists by themselves. And if I can be of any help uh, on the cases of rare diseases or hemophilia, uh, I, I would be more than happy to do it. Thank you once again and have a wonderful autumn, all of you.